Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Our speaker today will be Dr. Eileen Cole from Stanford University. Eileen is a research scientist in the Stanford Nanoshirt facilities where she oversees the aberration corrected monochromated Titan environmental transmission electromicroscope. Eileen obtained her PhD from Stanford University in 2008 and was a postdoctoral research associate at Imperial College London from 2008 to 2010. Her research focuses on the application of advanced electron microscopy techniques to solve materials related problems. Next slide, please. Just a couple of points before we begin. Um, please submit any questions that you have using the uh, question pane in GoToMeeting window. Um, issues regarding connectivity will be answered immediately. We will compile the questions and we will answer um, as much as time allows at the end of the uh, presentation. And if there is any um, questions remaining uh, within a few days, we will email everyone the answers to the remaining questions that were not answered during this time. With this, um, I give it to Eileen, which will be talking about practical approaches for in situ and environmental transmission electromicroscopy. Eileen, please go ahead. Thank you for the introduction, Anna. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this webinar today. My name is Eileen Cole, and today I'll be discussing practical approaches for in situ and environmental transmission electron microscopy. The outline of my talk is as follows. First, I will start with a background on this topic. Then I will discuss the development and applications of in situ high resolution transmission electron microscopy, expand into a discussion on environmental TEM. I will also highlight how in situ uh, environmental TEM can benefit from recent advances in imaging technology and ends with a discussion and my thoughts about uh, what I think the future outlook might be. So I would like to start off with this slide that shows the number of institute TEM papers published from 1970 to the year 2012. As you can see, when the field first started in the 1970s or so, there are relatively like fewer than five papers published each year. But you can see that there's a leapfrog in the number of in-situ um, TEM publications, especially in the year 2012. In the same year, 2012, there were two major electron microscopy conferences that were held, namely the Microscopy and Microanalysis Meeting, as well as the European Microscopy Congress. This slide shows the breakdown of the number of in-situ TEM papers presented at these two meetings, uh, categorized by stimulus, namely electrical bias, electron beam-induced heating, controlled heating using a heating holder, gas-related experiments, liquid-related experiments, mechanical stimulus, and laser stimulus. As you can see from the breakdown of this uh, pay, um, category, there is a dominance in the number of um, in-situ uh, gas uh, papers. In fact, one should say that the topic of in-situ TEM is really not new. In the year 1981, there is a seminal book published by Butler and Hale entitled Dynamic Experiments in the Electron Microscope. And if we look at the list of chapters uh, in this book, you will see uh, similar such as um, deformation, um, high temperature, low temperature, gas solid reactions, wet cell microscopy, magnetization, etc., which are in fact the same stimuli that were presented in the 2012 papers. So the Butler and Hale book, which was written in 1981, coincided with the era of high voltage electron microscopy. And it was thought at that time that specimen thickness played an important role in this regard. And such, a lot of focus, um, a lot of attention was focused on the effect of specimen thickness on dynamic processes. And in fact, the first chapter of this book was dedicated to uh, the effect of uh, critical thicknesses in um, thin foil TEM samples. Paul Butler also did some in situ experiments during that time. And this is an example of um, uh, figures which were 
uh, extracted from an in-situ video recording which uh, from experiments that he had done. If you notice from the scale markers from this uh, figure captions, this scale marker over here on the bottom right-hand corner is one micrometer, which is basically on the order that one would achieve uh, with optical microscopy. And since these experiments are done using a high-voltage electron microscope, the specimens are a lot thicker, and so there is really no quantitative information at all. Around the same time, a group at Stanford University utilized a medium voltage electron microscope operated at 120 kV, and they reported the observations of atomic motion on the surface of a cadmium telluride single crystal. Since the microscope was a medium voltage microscope, 120 kilovolts, um, the sample use was much thinner and a lot of um, a lot more structural detail could be resolved from such thin samples. What the Stanford group observed was individual bright spots moving along the edge of uh, the cadmium telluride sample over time. Jumps would occur several times per second, usually corresponding to um, the, the distance usually corresponded to the atomic separation uh, between uh, the 111 planes of cadmium telluride. So uh, back then, um, the system did not have a video recording system, and what they did was to capture individual images as quickly as they could. The following year, the same experiments were repeated at Cambridge University, which also had a medium voltage electron microscope. I think it was probably about 300 kV or so, plus a real-time um, image pickup video recording system. And using that video recording system, they were able to capture a series of sharply partial dislocations moving through an atomic plane of cadmium telluride in four consecutive frames. This now brings us to the definition of in situ transmission electron microscopy, which is the TEM examination of dynamic events in a sample under a controlled externally applied stimulation. <clears throat> Examples of stimulations can include temperature, mechanical stress, electrical potential, or a controlled environment such as gas or liquid. Um, so the development of in situ high resolution electron microscopy is documented in um, this review paper. And somewhere in this review paper, it says something about a that special specimen holder employed to manipulate the specimen temperature. Now, I want to note that the previous two examples of cadmium telluride that I had shown were basically atomic motions induced by electron beam heating. The same group was able to uh, install a heating holder on their medium uh, voltage electron microscope, which could um, control the temperature accurately and at the same time also install a video recording system. So with these two uh, improvements uh, or add-ons to uh, their setup, they were now able to record real-time uh, videos by controlling the temperature accurately to 500 degrees Celsius. And this video shows um, the atomic motion at, of cadmium telluride uh, when the sample was heated to 500 degrees Celsius where you could see basically um, hopping of the uh, atoms from um, the uh, outermost um, uh, edge of the thin foil sample. So here are some other examples of um, in situ experiments that have been performed using other stimuli. Um, so the first example over here utilizes nano compression to measure the mechanical properties and observe microstructural evolution of nanoscale volumes simultaneously. The second example here shows how in situ magnetization can uh, lead to changes in domain walls in magnetic structures when you apply a change in uh, um, um, magnetic um, stimulus. And um, this third example here shows how the application of an electrical bias can be used to study battery and phase change uh, memory devices. 
The approach for in-situ TEM includes a stable TEM, preferably a medium voltage microscope because with thin samples, um, there is more structural detail and more quantitative information that can be uh, resolved. Plus, uh, one would need a specialized sample holder as well as an image capture or recording system. The um, second approach, which is for environmental TEM, uh, can utilize either a dedicated environmental TEM instrument or you can use a membrane-based specimen holder. And of course, you would also need um, a standard uh, microscope plus uh, image capture recording system. Moving on to the advantages of in-situ high-resolution TEM, um, they are, firstly, the atomic um, mechanisms are directly observable. All sequential events can be recorded. Um, the information that one can obtain using in-situ high-resolution TEM is really not provided by alternative means. And um, that you can also conduct a rapid survey of the reaction phenomenon. There are also disadvantages associated with this approach. First, experiments are always difficult, and proper experiments uh, can be time consuming. And whenever uh, people talk about um, TEM studies, um, there's always questions about the influence of uh, thin foil surfaces. But in this era of nanomaterials, where everyone is trying to look at nanoparticles, nanowires, etc. Um, the high, uh, um, the large surface area to volume ratio associated with these um, nanomaterials are in fact of interest to the community. So there are some guidelines that have been developed for in situ um, TEM over the years, which are to compare the results from thin and thick areas of the sample, to perform the experiments by uh, with the electron beam on versus electron beam off to see if there's any um, influence of the electron beam. Um, one can also con uh, compare um, in situ versus in situ uh, versus ex situ experiments uh, by looking at the bulk microstructure development and compare activation energies. And uh, an advantage of having a thin foil sample is that after the first round of in situ TM experiments, you can re-iron uh, mill the uh, thin foil sample and re-examine um, um, the newly um, the new thin electron transparent regions. And I must add at this point that the beam on and beam off studies are especially important for uh, especially important for liquid and gas cell related studies. And this I would elaborate towards um, um, the second half of my talk. So now moving on to environmental TEM. <clears throat> the in-situ TEM examples that we have looked at so far involved the examination of the specimens uh, under high vacuum conditions, which is um, in typically on the order of 10 to the minus 7 millibars or so. In environmental TEM experiments, <coughs> excuse me, the samples are exposed to a reactive gas or liquid environment and are studied at the sub-nanometer resolution of a transmission electron microscope. Earlier um, this year, we published a book chapter um, that um, documents um, the brief history of controlled atmosphere transmission electron microscopy. So um, the start of this, this field actually started in the 1930s. And since um, the beginning of um, the field in the 1930s, there are essentially two approaches to environmental TEM. The first is through the use of specialized environmental TEM holders. And the second approach involves the use of a specialized environmental TEM microscope and instrument. And uh, what I should add that the ETEM instrument is specific just for gas cell studies. Um, and uh, the nice thing about having an instrument is that you can combine it with other uh, specialized uh, holders, be it like heating, cooling, or electrical biasing. So let's move on to this slide, which shows the schematic of what a specialized environmental TEM holder looks like. 
The setup basically consists of a pair of electron transparent windows um, above and below the specimen. The specimen is usually dispersed on a membrane that is um, on the um, inside of um, the sandwich window within which uh, one can introduce gas or liquid. The windows isolate the liquid or gas environment from the high vacuum of the transmission electron microscope. The second approach involves the use of a specialized environmental TEM instrument. And this slide here shows the schematic of um, the instrument setup. In the ECAM, the objective pole pieces function as an environmental cell and gas is introduced to within the objective lenses. There are six apertures located inside the microscope column, which limit the volume of gas diffusing to other parts of the column, such as the electron source. And um, in an environmental TEM instrument, the gas is differentially pumped out of the co column using a series of turbo-mechanical pumps. These photographs show an environmental TEM which we have in our lab. This view here, appearing in the second photograph on the right here, shows the additional turbo pumps and lines which support the environmental mode of the instrument. Now, having um, gone through the two approaches to ECAM, let us compare the advantages and disadvantages that these two approaches bring. So with a gas cell holder, one can achieve pressures up above one bar. You can utilize a complete range of gases and liquids using an enclosed cell holder. A holder like this is available for all modern instruments, but the presence of membranes associated with these um, holders degrade uh, resolution. On the other hand, with a specialized ETEM machine, there are no membranes, and so if the instrument is equipped with aberration correction, the aberration correction um, resolution is maintained, and so is um, the energy resolution in um, electron energy loss spectroscopy. However, with a specialized E10 instrument, um, there is an upper limit on the gas pressure that you can use. Usually, it's up to about 10 millibars or so. There are also limitations with um, the gas types. And of course, um, it requires a specialized ETEM instrument, which uh, most of the time uh, is not inexpensive. Now, here are some examples of applications of um, controlled environment TEM. Using a liquid cell TEM holder, one can construct a wet battery device and study, for example, the structure and chemistry at the uh, solid electrolyte interface um, between the cathode and the anode of um, um, the battery. Another example associated with um, liquid cell TEM is that uh, one can um, preserve the native state of biological samples um, while uh, keeping the samples native in their liquid environment and looking at them inside um, using the high uh, resolution of the electron microscope. A specialized gas cell holder allows one to study catalysts in their working state. This is an example of a copper zinc oxide catalyst, which is imaged at uh, 500 degrees Celsius. Uh, under 1.2 uh, atmospheres of hydrogen. And using a liquid cell holder or an ETEM instrument, one can grow in situ nanowires, nanotubes, for example, and study the growth mechanism. So as it turns out, for um, gas-associated experiments, the technique of electron energy loss spectroscopy is actually a very powerful method to study gas types and gas mixtures. So this is work done by Professor Peter Crozier's group at Arizona State University, and they have shown that um, the low energy loss field spectra provide the un uh, unique fingerprint for different types of gases, and um, they could also measure uh, composition of gases 
uh, with an accuracy of 15% or better. Using eels, one can also detect in situ the oxidation of carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide by monitoring this emergence of the carbon pie star peak, which is associated with CO2 at increasing temperatures. As you can see, at higher temperatures, um, the uh, reaction occurs faster, and therefore there is this uh, higher intensity of the carbon pie star peak associated uh, with CO2. And uh, another example of eels in an ETEM experiment is that uh, we can also use this technique to measure the absorption and desorption of hydrogen in individual palladium nanotubes by monitoring the shift in the palladium bulk plasmon resonant energies when palladium transforms to palladium hydride. And then we can also understand um, the hydrogen loading and unloading behavior of individual palladium particles by correlating um, their, trans, um, their phase transformation with the size effects of the palladium particles. I had mentioned um, in the earlier part of my talk that the beam-on, beam-off studies are especially important for liquid and gas cell experiments. And I would like to elaborate this through an example um, concerning oxidation of carbon nanotubes, which we had performed um, from a few years ago. So the work was published in ACS Nano in the year 2013. And the background of this study is that carbon nanotubes can be used as fuel emission sources in X-ray tubes for medical applications. And from measurements of fuel emission under non-optimum vacuum conditions, some types of nanotubes are shown to be longer lasting than others. And therefore, we wanted to find out which nanotubes would fail first <clears throat> and how they would fail as we expose them to a heated, oxidized environment inside the ETEM. So I had talked about the usefulness of eels. Um, for in gas experiments. So the cool thing about eels is that when one introduces oxygen into the ETEM column, you can turn on the electron beam and then collect, um, for example, an oxygen KH eel spectrum as well as the low energy loss eel spectrum of oxygen to confirm that you do have oxygen flowing in um, your microscope. But the the other aspect of having such data means that the electron beam is actually ionizing the gas. So in order to ensure that we are studying the effect of molecular oxidation gas on the carbon nanotubes and not ionized oxygen, we established the experimental protocol to blank the electron beam when gas is flowing inside the microscope. So to reiterate the experimental protocols that we adopted for this set of experiments, first of all, we operated at 80 kV, to, uh, which is below the uh, threshold for knock-on damage for carbon nanotube. The sample was first heated to 300 degrees Celsius in high vacuum. We would identify nanotubes that we would track in the whole experiment. And then after identifying the nanotubes, the electron beam was blanked. And after we ensure that there's no electron beam illumination on the sample, we then introduce oxygen into the ETEM column, um, let the re reaction go for about 15 minutes or so. We will purge the oxygen while maintaining the temperature. And after gas has been completely purged, we would unblank the beam, locate and image the same nanotubes. So using this experimental protocol of uh, blanking the electron beam with oxygen, when oxygen was in the column, these were the results that we obtained. So this is an um, image of a, a double wall nanotube um, acquired at 300 degrees Celsius before oxidation. And by tracking this same carbon nanotube, these are images of what the nanotube looks like at 300 degrees Celsius after being oxidized and at 400 degrees Celsius after oxidation. If we zoom in to um, these um, areas here, 
you can see that um, oxidation occurred at the side walls of um, the um, um, double wall carbon nanotubes. Occasionally, we would also find oxidation starting from the innermost wall, as we can see from uh, by comparing um, these two images. And presumably, this could uh, be the result of oxygen infiltrating from the, end, the other end of the carbon nanotube, which might be an open end. And unlike what had been previously thought and reported in the literature, carbon nanotubes are not found um, to oxidize at their tube caps at all. However, the situation is very different. Uh, when we have the imaging electron beam illuminated when oxygen is flowing inside the column. So a reminder again about electron beam ionizing the gas. So when we have gas flowing in, inside the ETAM column um, by means of U spectroscopy, we can see the ionization edges of um, <coughs> um, oxygen from the U spectrum, which indicates that the electron beam is ionizing the gas. And if we keep the electron beam on during an oxidation experiment, um, these are examples of uh, movies of um, nanotubes <coughs> imaged in 0 0.7 millibars oxygen, this time at room temperature, when um, oxygen and carbon are, not, uh, are known not to react at this, temp uh, at this condition. We find that if we keep the beam on when oxygen is flowing, we start seeing attack along uh, um, on the cheap, um, cap of the carbon nanotubes. And in addition to the edge, it seems like it's also attacking the side walls of the nanotube. Here you can see over here that part of the graphitic wall um, amorphizes and, um, and the um, nanotube gets destroyed. So when the electron beam was switched on while oxygen was flowing in to inside the ETAM column, the nanotubes were destroyed from both um, caps and edges. And one explanation of this is using image force effects. Basically, the incident electron beam ionizes the oxygen gas molecules. The charged oxygen ions are in turn attracted to the grounded nanotube especially at the tip, which in turn results in the destruction of the nanotube. <coughs> we quantified the influence of the electron beam in the gas experiment uh, by plotting a graph of cumulative electron dose in units of number of electrons per square angstrom versus pressure. So we did these experiments of electron beam illumination both in um, the oxygen environment and uh, by illuminating the uh, carbon nanotubes just in high vacuum. And we find that there is a two order of magnitude difference in the cumulative electron dose to damage carbon nanotubes in high vacuum versus in oxygen. So in summary, when the electron beam was illuminated in the presence of gas, carbon nanotubes were destroyed at both caps and edges. And with a high enough cumulative electron dose, carbon nanotubes can both can in fact be damaged both in and without the presence of the gas. It is therefore very important when one is performing ETM experiments to try and quantify the effect of the electron beam and also establish protocols which allows one to study the interaction of materials with molecular gas species instead of ionized gas species. So some discussions about um, in-situ ETAM experiments. As you can see from the above example, the imaging, the imaging electron beam effects are definitely more important in gas-related experiments. So it is therefore important to develop in-situ strategies when one is performing um, controlled environment um, experiments. This can include beam blanking during the reaction. Um, adopting some kind of fast recording, low dose, um, if it's possible, to set up low dose mode um, during um, the imaging process. And what I've shown is an example for um, gas cell work. 
And my understanding reading uh, from the literature is that liquid cell work is equally, if not more, susceptible. And But on the other hand, sometimes the influence of the electron beam um, can be useful. For example, um, there have been groups which use, utilize the electron beam to trigger reactions. So it really depends on what uh, phenomenon you are trying to study and therefore um, plan your experiments accordingly. The next section of my talk discusses how in situ both um, high vacuum and environmental TEM can benefit from recent advances in imaging technology. So I think that the first and the most important advancement in this field is really the development of aberration correctors. Um, with aberration correction, um, there's significant improvement in data quality, and um, you can one can now work at um, different acceleration voltages depending on um, which is more conducive for your material type without any compromise in spatial resolution. Um, some would say also that aberration corrected images are directly interpretable. So an example um, of images of aberration correction off versus uh, no aberration correction versus aberration correction can be found here on this right panel. The top image shows um, a TEM image of carbon nanotubes acquired, uh, taken in the 1990s where there was no aberration correction, and this was an image obtained at uh, 100 kV using the state-of-the-art TEM during that time. This bottom image is an aberration-corrected TEM image acquired um, at 80 kV uh, with uh, an image-corrected system. And as you can tell from um, this, uh, by comparing these two images, there is a qualitative improvement in um, the um, image quality of the second over the first. So modern TEMs are a lot more stable, and um, I would in fact say that the combination of aberration correction and improvements in image um, in instrument stability actually spearheaded the development and growth of in situ holder technology that we have seen in recent years. The second improvement. Um, is um, the improvement in camera technology. In addition to CCD and direct electron detectors, cameras utilizing a CMOS-based sensor are available today. One such example uh, is the um, OneView camera, which is a CMOS-based um, sensor and uh, has a 4K by 4K uh, pixel resolution and a frame rate of 25 frames per second. So with the CMOS architecture, um, there's a rolling shutter incorporated, which is uh, very useful because it enables image drift correction. So I'm going to now show an iPhone video. Um, so what you see here is basically a video taken, and this is a screenshot of um, the um, interface uh, with which um, the OneView camera is equipped with. And uh, I'm going to start playing this movie. It, um, this video was taken during an in situ, when we were doing an in situ heating experiment using a furnace based heating holder. I believe the sample was heated to 600 degrees Celsius, and you can see that significant image drift, um, sample drift. And with um, um, the rolling shutter, one can enable drift correction, whereby the um, camera would basically acquire multiple frames and cross-correlate and uh, do a cross-correlation of multiple frames. And what in turn you will get will be an image with minimum or no drift correction. So these are two examples of TM images, um, which uh, I had extracted from um, the Gaten website, showing drift correction off versus drift correction on. So you can see that uh, the quality of the uh, image significantly improves with drift correction on. And another advantage of um, this camera is its high sensitivity 
and the large field of view. In this um, in-situ video recording, we show a monolayer of uh, molybdenum disulfide sample, and the scale bar here is um, 10 nanometers. And so as you can see from this scale marker, that is a pretty large field of view that this camera offers. And what happens is that um, during um, illumination under the electron beam, the electron beam induces sputtering of the sulfur atoms in the molydisulfide um, monolayer. And what you can start seeing is the gradual formation of what appears to be defective planes. And over the course of time, some holes start breaking up in these few areas like over here. So what is of interest to us is actually the formation of um, um, MOS interconnecting wires that we start, that you see start appearing in this images, in this video. So with the large field of view, you can see that there's a lot of action happening in this sample. But the nice thing is that um, this is all being recorded. And the individual frames uh, have been recorded, and they have the full resolution, the full 4, 4K by 4K image resolution, which we can then go back after the experiment to analyze um, these images. So what we found using a combination of the experimental data and simulations is that um, the wires have a rotational twisting motion. And uh, we could see that uh, it takes about one second for uh, the wire to undergo a whole rotation. And also, we were able to analyze convective frames, such as this panel of images over here. And if we denote the segment on the left as um, number one, which is what we would term maybe our anchoring segment, we see that uh, the wire actually uh, loses uh, segments uh, over time, and when one segment is lost in the middle, two opposing segments will have identical orientation, and so rotational twists are introduced into the MOS wires. In terms of future outlook, I started this presentation by showing the number of in-situ TEM papers published from 1970 to 2012. So let's look at how uh, what has happened since 2012. So the first slide um, with the statistic of 2012 ended here. And these are the number of institute publications in the year 2013 and 2014. So you can see that the year 2013 had about the same number of publications as 2012. But again, one sees this leapfrog in the number of publications for the year 2014. And until November of 2015, this is where uh, our most recent statistics shows. So if we, again, look at the number of breakdowns, uh, the breakdown of the number of institute TEM papers in 2015 at the M&M &M meeting by stimulus, um, in the year 2015, you can see that there's basically like um, equal distribution of uh, the number of um, gas-related and liquid cell-related uh, in-situ TEM papers. So in conclusion, in-situ and environmental TEM is one of the most rapidly growing areas in TEM. Combining aberration correct TEM capabilities with environmental control opens up ever more powerful ways to investigate material behavior. High-impact areas include catalysis, nanomaterials, electrochemical behavior, corrosion, um, studying biological specimens in their native environment, etc. As with all in situ experiments, observations need to be checked um, with alternative means, uh, particularly the influence of the electron beam for gas and relate, uh, liquid related experiments. And finally, in situ environmental TEM is expected to benefit immensely from recent advances in instrumentation and image capture technology. So 
With this, I have come to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much once again for tuning in, and um, I look forward to uh, talking to you soon. With this, I will hand the um, controls back over to Anna. Thank you very much, Eileen, for a very interesting talk. Um, we've had quite a few questions coming in. Um, just a reminder, if you still have some questions, you can submit them using the question panel in the GoToWebinar window. Um, unfortunately, we will not have time to answer all the questions, but um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we will compile all the answers and we will email them to you in future days. Um, also, a reminder that the, this webinar uh, has been recorded and it will be available on the TAN website uh, in the coming days. Okay, so let's start uh, with the questions. The first one, Irene, is could you please suggest best approaches to test and prevent beam damage, like oxidation and reduction? Um, best approaches to? Test and prevent beam damage. Test and prevent. Yeah. Beam damage. Okay. So um, the example which um, I had shown um, to test beam damage was um, as okay. Let me pull back to one of the earlier slides. So what we sought to do because you know it's sort of like a catch twenty two situation because um, in order for one to do any form of in situ recording, you will, you will really need to turn the electron beam on. So what we have thought to do was to do um, to try and quantify um, the influence of the electron beam. So for example, um, in um, in this slide that I had shown, um, um, what we did was to um, document what the electron dose rate is that we have used in the experiments, document the time it takes to, let's say, um, for the samples to be damaged basically by electron beam illumination. And what we have uh, found was um, there probably is a threshold. So if um, we can quantify the electron beam effect and then um, seek to work at um, electron dose levels that are below the threshold for um, damage from gas ionization, then uh, I think um, that um, this would be a strategy to say that my control experiments show that um, X electrons per square angstrom is the threshold um, to cause um, gas ionization induced damage and therefore whatever experiments that I want to report which shows the real influence of the gas minus the beam, then I would work at below the threshold level. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, which is what is uh, some of the most common mistakes your users make during in situ experiments? Common mistakes. Um, okay. I think. Um, I think for in situ experiments, there's probably a lot of planning that needs to be in. Um, there should be a lot of planning and a lot of consideration um, to be made before um, before starting the experiment itself. Let's say, for instance, um, if you want to find out the um, like you know like oxidation or hydrogen absorption, how, you, how are you going to measure it? How are you going to measure, uh, um, so what will be the change in properties as a result in hydrogen absorption? Is it a lattice expansion? Is it a shift in plasma resonance? So you really, I think you have to first of all, you have to identify what the best technique is to measure, um, to uh, what the best technique is for your experiments, and then also for gas experiments, it could also be as you know, like um, something as fundamental as what sort of TEM grids I should be using. So let's say if you have, um, if you're going to do say a hydrogen experiment, um, one I would never encourage 
in fact, I would never like get uh, encourage anyone to use, let's say, uh, any TM grids with like carbon support film at all because um, you will form maybe like you know the the carbon might react with the hydrogen and form like hydrocarbons, for example, during the experiment. So it would be, I would say that um, it's not more it's not more a mistake per se, but it's more like um, um, experiments plan the rigor of experiment experimental planning it becomes ever more important um, for in situ experiments to do the proper and the actual experiments. Thank you. Um, another question is about um, data sets for in situ experiments. How do you handle large data sets and what software do you use to process the in situ data? Ah, okay. So um, in um, as you can imagine from with these um, um, in situ recordings, um, what you would end up would be say if you record at 4K by 4K resolution, um, you would end up with um, maybe about I think an image which is what 65, 66 megabytes multiplied by 20. Five and that is the number. That is the sort of data size that you would need to manage. Uh, and 66 multiplied by 25 megabytes is the data size uh, per second. So with large data sets, um, I know um, like um, there are basically you can either use software that the manufacturer provides. I have also known of some research groups that um, write their own MATLAB scripts, for example, to process data sets. But what I have been doing is to use um, the post-processing software that um, GATAN provides with, uh, as part of the um, GMS3 interface. So the the soft the post-processing software what with the post-processing software you can. Um, do data processing such as you can crop, you can bin, you can convert the um, uh, raw data file into like a like a video format, like an AVI or an MP4 file, which makes the data set uh, more manageable. And uh, by using techniques like binning and cropping, um, you can basically uh, um, throw out um, um, areas like regions in the image that you do not need and so that is also a strategy to um, uh, reduce the, 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 the size of the data set. Okay, um, let me um, ask you one more question. Okay. Um, Okay, sorry, I'm just looking at how significant is the degradation in resolution by the membranes in gas cell holders? Mm. I do not have an exact answer right now because I have, n I have yet to test out a gas cell holder, but I think I will have the answer. Um, I can give you the actual answer in a few months, but okay. my 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 um, thought is that with the gas cell holder, um, for gas experiments with a gas cell holder, the I'm I'm not like I think the the thickness of the membranes that um, of these membranes are probably about 25 30 nanometers or so. So um, with the gas cell holder itself, simply by Using the membranes, you can add between 50 and you have a nominal membrane thickness of 50 to 60 nanometers to begin with because um, they are basically two membranes. Um, the gas cell, um, as for the gas inside the gas cell holder, um, I my understanding is that there's very little um, um, like um, deterioration from the gas itself because the gas path is um, uh, relatively um, uh, narrow. 
Okay, um, that's all the time we have today um, for um, for this webinar. Um, Eileen, I would like to thank you again for very interesting work. Um, and again, a reminder, uh, the remaining questions uh, will be answered via email. Uh, we have recorded this webinar and we will post it on GATAN uh, website, www.gatan.com. Thank you all.